Thank you, Sunil. After that uh, introduction, uh, you know, uh, there's some performance pressure on me. So, good evening, evening, ladies and gentlemen. And uh, I realize I am the, the very last speaker of the day, so I have some additional performance pressure in keeping you all awake. Now, what I thought may be useful for uh, a session like this, which is at the end of a long day, is perhaps to give you some sense of the underlying philosophical framework which the current government is using for its economic policy making. I think this is important because we live at a time where the underlying conceptual philosophical framework, the meta-narrative so to speak, is being radically changed. And I think it's important to understand what the new meta-narrative is because that will explain to you what is being done, how it's being done, and the sequence in which things are being done. Now, many of you may have heard Prime Minister Modi use the term, the new India. Now, what does that really mean? So, let me try and explain that to you, but to start with, let me give you a flavor. Basically, it is the idea of shifting an India from a hierarchical, static, patronage-based, rent-seeking system to a system that is much more rule-oriented, rule-based, much, much more about social mobility, about entrepreneurship, innovation, and risk-taking. In fact, the word that kind of brings it all together is a word which he likes using very often, is the word manthan. It's a word that is, of course, comes with heavy meaning for those of you who are conversant with Indian mythology and philosophical tradition. But manthan, when you use this term in the context of economic thinking, means the following things. It means the churn of new ideas and old ideas. It means social churn and mobility. The idea that anybody, if they are talented and willing to work hard and take risks, can go from the bottom to the top, something that he himself embodies. <coughs> it is the idea of economic churn, the idea that the economy is made up of people who are continuously working hard, taking risks, innovating, and consequently, continuously evolving. Now, when you sort of take this kind of a philosophical, manthan based, a fluid view of the world, I'm going to show you how it would begin to not just question the old, static, socialist view of economics, but in fact, it is quite different from even a lot of other mainstream economics. So let me use an analogy to try and explain to you how the new way of thinking about the world, the more fluid, churning view of the world, is different from the other static view of the world. Now most mainstream economics, both, both socialist and neoclassical, derives much of its conceptual frameworks essentially from Newtonian mechanics. People don't realize this. This is the reason why mainstream economics is full of terms like liquidity, which is basically a term derived from hydraulics, or equilibrium, or the idea of levers of monetary and fiscal policy. Essentially, the view is that the economy is a gigantic machine, like a Victorian steam engine running on fixed rails and that most of macroeconomic policy is really about doing the following things, that if the economy is going too fast, applying the brakes and if it's going too slowly, you shovel in more coal in the hope of speeding it up. But what if the economy is not a gigantic machine? What if it's an evolving ecosystem? What if it is an ecosystem that is continuously buffeted by all kinds of shocks. Black swans of all kinds. 
could be technological so shocks, it could be geopolitical shocks, it could be political shocks, it could be all kinds of shocks. Now you can see that this is a very different world. It's a world without equilibrium. Rather than going from one static equilibrium to some other idealized equilibrium, it's about managing transitions. When you think about this world as this complex adaptive system, full of butterfly effects and black swans, then the way you manage this and make policy for it becomes very, very different. And I'm going to use an analogy so that you begin to understand what I mean. Now many of you have dogs. And I'm sure you take your dog out to the park and throw a frisbee and get it to catch the frisbee. Now, most normal people will just throw the frisbee and the frisbee will catch the frisbee. But unfortunately, that's not how, not how most economists would go about it. And if you were an economist, this is the, what you would actually do. You would first go to the park and measure the speed of the wind. And then you would study very carefully the breed of your dog. Then you would look at the frisbee and study the design of the frisbee. And you would also do studies on your strength. And then you would take all of this and stick it onto an Excel sheet. And then you would run a general equilibrium model on your computer for various iterations. And it would give you a forecast. And then you would take the forecast and you would, if you were in the government, give it to the Frisbee Policy Committee, which would meet once a quarter. And you would take your forecast and it would give you forward guidance. Now based on this forward guidance, you would take your dog to the park, put a stake in the ground where the forward guidance says where the Frisbee is going to land, and you would then tie your dog to that stake in the ground. Now as you all know, forget about the world, even a park is a complex system. There can be a gust of wind, your frisbee could have a small scratch in it which would completely potentially change the direction in which it flies. The way, this, the angle at which you throw the frisbee could be slightly different from what you had put in your model. And essentially the frisbee will land somewhere other than where you tied the dog. And of course your dog would fail to catch the frisbee. Now meanwhile, most normal people are throwing their frisbee and the dog is catching the frisbee. Question is, how is the dog catching the frisbee? The dog catches the frisbee essentially by doing the following thing. It looks generally at the owner and tries to figure out roughly in which direction the frisbee is going to be thrown and then positions itself. Then we throw the frisbee, it looks at the frisbee and runs after it. Then as the frisbee comes down, the dog looks again at the frisbee and begins to position itself and at the last minute just before it hits the ground, the dog, keeping its eye on the frisbee, jumps up and catches the frisbee. Now what is this model of catching the frisbee? Basically what it is doing is feedback loop and adjustment. This is not about some grand forecast created by some great planning commission wise man about where the frisbee will go. This is about watching what is happening and flexibly adapting to it. All of you who run businesses who are successful will be doing this all the time. But economists are entirely surprised. <laughs> economists are entirely surprised when their dog is unable to catch the frisbee. And what they will do is a few months later they will issue a report with a detailed description, the charts and tables telling you why they couldn't catch the frisbee. Now that I've explained to you how thinking of the world is a complex evolving ecosystem which is prone to all kinds of unpredictable, indeterminable shocks. Then you have understood how we then begin to make policy for it. Now in order to understand this, I am going to take another analogy which has nothing to do again with direct economics but you will very quickly see where I am going with it. <coughs> now everybody in this country says our cities are in disastrous shape. Whenever you are poor people and you ask them, you know, how do you, you know, what should we be doing? So we should plan our cities better. So you say, okay, 
So which do you think is the best planned city in this country? And without fail, everybody will say Chandigarh. So I say, okay. And which do you think is the best planned city in the world? And most of you will then say Singapore. So the impression you will be given is that if only Chandigarh did, went to the gym more often and worked a little harder, it would end up as becoming like Singapore. But let me show you why this is actually impossible because Singapore and Chandigarh have exactly opposite models of how they go about building their city. Now, we went back to the 1950s. Le Corbusier was called in to design Singapore. Now, Singapore, uh, sorry, not Singapore, Chandigarh. So, Le Corbusier was called in to design Chandigarh. Now, to understand Le Corbusier, got to understand that when he was asked what he thought about cities and buildings, he made the following statement, which is that essentially buildings and cities are like machines for living. Now, remember what I told you in the beginning, the way of thinking about a machine? Now, how do you build a machine? You build a machine by meticulously planning out all the parts and then meticulously following the plan and putting them all together. That's how you build a machine. So consequently, this is how Chandigarh was built. You had a very detailed master plan. And since then, we have remained very, very true to that master plan. Now look at what Singapore did instead. Singapore became free in 1965. When it became free, it was, one, it was a hopelessly poor city. There was... <coughs> Not only really slums there, but regular communal riots. Large parts of the city were actually run by mafia triads. It was really a hopeless case. It was such a hopeless case, in fact, that it was actually thrown out of the Malaysian Federation. The S in Malaysia is actually for Singapore, but it's no longer there. So it became free and it had basically no resources at all. In fact, even today, it imports its water from Malaysia. So what could they do? Now, Prime Minister Lee Kuan Yew looked around himself and found that he had only one resource, and which was that the British, while they were leaving their naval port, had left behind this uh, naval facility. And so they basically began to convert it into a container terminal. They also began to, he also began to encourage Singapore to become a light manufacturing hub. So Singapore, originally in the 60s and 70s, was a place where cheap ready-made garments used to be made. In fact, they used to make rip-off and fake versions of other countries' things. So that's why it had, in fact, created a brand called Crocodile, which was a blatant rip-off of Lacoste. And this model was so successful that by 1980, it was no longer possible for Singapore to survive because its per capita income and wages had gone up too high to be functioning, doing cheap labor. So what did it do? It moved into electronics. And those of you who remember going to Singapore in the 80s and 90s will remember that Singapore was the place to buy cheap electronics. In fact, many of you may have gone, landed in Singapore and gone to Mustafa and bought cheap electronics. But by 2000 or thereabouts, it became quite obvious that Singapore was not even competitive to manufacture electronics. So by the late 90s, Singapore began to convert itself into a major financial hub. And it became essentially Asia's most important financial hub. And later on, more recently, it has invested and become a hub for entertainment and for education. Now, nobody in the 1970s would have imagined going to Singapore to go for an education. But many of you in this room today will perhaps be sending your kids to Singapore to study. Now, the point I'm making is Singapore's entire model is not based on having a master plan. It is based on feedback loop and adaptation. Now, meanwhile, what have we done with Chandigarh? The bureaucrats who run Chandigarh are very, very proud that they have stuck with the original master plan of Le Corbusier. In fact, when you go and visit them, they tell you this very proudly themselves. And so, Chandigarh has remained essentially a subsidy scheme for civil servants. Whatever little zing it has comes from a part of Chandigarh, which is not inside Chandigarh, which is Mohali, which is not, incidentally, a part of the plan. So, as you can see, this is the, the difference between the approach of having a master plan and an approach of using 
essentially continuous adaptation and feedback loops in order to make policy and move forward. No matter how hard you try the Chandigarh, it's never going to become a Singapore. The best you can afford, get out of it is something like Brasilia maybe. Now what does this mean as far as making policy is concerned today? Now hopefully you can see the kind of framework, philosophical background that I'm giving you. So not surprisingly therefore, one of the very important and first reforms that this government carried out was bankruptcy, bankruptcy laws. Why bankruptcy laws? Because it is a view that if you do not have, in, in, a, in a view of churn, of manthan, if you do not have wish, you cannot have amrit. So consequently, if you do not have exit, you cannot have entry. So in order to have an entrepreneurial economy which is going through continuous churn, one of the first most important things you need is bankruptcy laws. That is the reason bankruptcy laws were one of the first things that were done by this government. It is the same reason that we have gone about doing cleaning up of the NPAs in the banking system in the particular way we have. In the beginning of this year, you may remember, there was a lot of debate about how to clean up the banks and one of the suggestions was to create a bad bank. Now why did we create a bad bank? And why did we go about using the bankruptcy route in order to clean up the banks? The reason for it is, even though we realize that it can be initially a little bit more painful to go about it the way we are, we, we came to the conclusion that the bad bank would essentially be a warehouse, a sort of latter day DIFR. But if you see the philosophical framework we come from, we would much rather go through the churn, the pain of having taken many of these cases through the painful process of resolution, rather than allow them to fester forever. And it is not just about the types of things we are doing, it also fits through with the way we are going about doing things. So for example, GST was debated for some 20 odd years. And finally when the deal was struck, Everybody said, you know, you're not yet ready to do it, maybe you should do it next year, so that all the bits and pieces can be put together. And there was a lot of debate about this, by the way, and many of you will remember that. And yet the government decided to go through it in July this year, knowing fully well that not all the pieces are being put together. Why did it do that? It did that because of the view that when you are doing something as complicated as GST and as complicated a country like India, no amount of modeling was ever going to tell you what was going to happen before you actually did it. There were always going to be all kinds of unintended consequences. So the only way to do it was to do it and then to fix it along the way. Now yes, it looks a little messy. Yes, the way it is right now, even despite, <clears throat> you know, now being into a month and a half, uh, uh, <clears throat> or now more than two months, in fact, of having done it. There are all kinds of unanswered un answer questions. But the idea is you do it and you try and fix it with having a feedback loop. And hopefully some part of that feedback loop is working. We are overwhelmed with all kinds of feedback that we are getting. Uh, right now it's a lot, but we are working our way through it. And hopefully by the end of the year, substantial proportion of it will be done. And you'll actually have a system that sort of works. The same thing is true of the way the NPA resolution is being done. When the NPA resolution was being put in place, we were told, look, the bankruptcy law is not tested. The NCLT has never been tested. Absolutely. But we have identified 50 odd cases which are very important and we will take it through the system. Only through the process of taking it through the system will you find out what does not work and then we will fix it. This is the only way to do it. No amount of having attempted to plan and model this beforehand would have told us about all the small little things we will find out along the way. And as we fix this, we will create precedents, we will create procedures and that is how this whole thing will work. It again looks messier but the job gets done. And the same principle will now be applied with many other things. But 
The result of this is, rather than spend large amount of time thinking through and trying to design, we have discovered that it is much faster to get things done in this way. Hence, however it happens, you will get an Air India privatization. Hence, however it gets done, you will get some form of labor reforms sooner rather than later. Now, you may have already read in the newspapers, 40 odd laws have, or central laws have been brought down to about four. And they will, they are already being discussed at least inside the system. Now, is this the perfect law that should have, uh, are these laws the perfect ones? No. But what they at least do is bring those 40 to four. They synchronize the language and simplify it. The internal contradictions have been removed. At the end of doing all of this, at least you will have a set of laws that even if you think are imperfect, you will know what to fix going into the next round because right now, fixing 40 laws is simply impossible. You fix a little bit of it somewhere, it, something else falls apart. So the point I'm making is, this is a process of feedback and iteration, which we think is a far faster way of loading on a lot more changes than would have been the case if we had attempted to do it using some other philosophical framework or the previous ways of doing it, messy as it may look. <coughs> now that I've given you the overall background, now let me give you some sense of the specific economic model that we are attempting to establish. Now since the model of economic growth is less about philosophizing and theorizing and about evidence gathering, now one of the things that we do know about economic growth is that there is one model of economic growth that works. Now there are various variations of this model, but roughly speaking this is a model that has worked very well in East Asia over the last 30-40 years. And in fact a variation of this was what got the West to develop in the 19th and early 20th centuries. And the model roughly goes like this. And as I said there are variations on it, but roughly speaking this is the model, the basic bare bones of it. Basically, a country goes through a demographic shift. During this demographic shift, the proportion of population of working age goes up sharply. Now, this not only creates a larger workforce, but because of the age bunching, it also creates an upward shift in savings rates, an upward bias in savings rates. So, if you begin to deploy this <coughs> workforce into jobs, they suddenly create savings. This savings goes into the financial system. The financial system then deploys this into investment. The investment creates more jobs. This more jobs creates more savings and so on. So you create a virtuous cycle. Now notice this is not about moving to a new equilibrium. It is about a virtuous cycle. It is about a series of transitions. <coughs> the question is how do we initiate something like this in India? And why does it not get going in India? Now, as you all know, India is currently just about entering this demographic phase. We will be in this sweet demographic phase for some 25, 30 years from, from, uh, from here on. And in fact, somewhere about 10 years from now, we will replace China as being the world's largest workforce. However, there is a problem. The problem is, and we have noticed this, because after all we have, in recent times, had periods of high growth. And yet it doesn't quite go into this virtuous cycle. Why doesn't it? The reason for it is twofold. One, is that if we do create some period of growth, and does create, let's say, some, some income, this income and generate savings which do not come back into the financial system. Why? Well, some of it may be cultural because of preference for gold. Some of it may be happening because it goes into the black economy and maybe part of that black economy then finds its way abroad. Some, a lot of it happens because the new set of workers that we have essentially do not have any financial accounts. And therefore, a lot of this money remains in cash or other forms of non-mobilizable savings. And so consequently what happens is, yes, you may get one round going, 
but it doesn't filter through to higher savings in the financial system. And even to the extent it finds its way into the financial system, the financial system then largely ends up misallocating it, as we have just noticed, which is one of the reasons we have this serious NPA problem. Now, of course, you can argue that, look, there are many other countries that have had NPA problems and they have still grown for a long time and you'll, I'm sure, give me the example of China. But the fact is, A, China will ultimately have to deal with this problem. But yes, it's true, they have sustained it for a long, long time. But not every country has been able to sustain it for so long. There are many countries in East Asia who attempted to go down this path. They generated a few rounds of growth and then had major crises. Example of that, all the East Asian countries that went through the um, Asian crisis. There was Philippines, there was Indonesia, Thailand, Malaysia. They all sort of seemed to be going into that virtuous cycle. Their banking systems then went and misallocated a large amount of capital. They got jammed and they've never quite recovered. So what we are attempting to do is to fix these two issues up front in an attempt to create the platform for 20, 30 years of sustained growth. So this is the context in which when we are trying to fix the mobilization of savings is the context of mobilization of savings that you need to think about things like Jandhan Yojana. Without Jandhan Yojana, you can create as many jobs as you want, but those jobs do not show through the feedback into the system. Similarly, the crackdown on the black economy. Again, a very important part, you cannot have the self-sustaining process if you have such a large part of your economy that is simply stuck up in the inefficiencies of the black economy or being siphoned abroad for that matter. And also, of course, the problem of gold, which also is a part of that same problem. In the same context, you can see why we are expending so much energy in cleaning up the banking system, even though we know that there is a fair amount of pain being caused by this. The reason for this is simple, because we want, before the boom, to clean up the banking system to some degree, so that when this massive expansion happens, and yes, India does need a banking system which is an order of magnitude larger than what it is today. But we do not have to reach the point of an order of magnitude larger than today and have to have NPA problems which are also an order of magnitude larger than today. Much better to create a new culture of this new India that I described that has already had at least a process of cleaning up well before we go through this boom. So I've now given you a sort of general view of the philosophy, the model, a rough idea hopefully of the kinds of things we are doing and the sequence we are doing it. Now before I end, I'm going to give you some flavor of what are, what are the things that should be done going into the future. Now this churning kind of economy that I described is obviously requires certain kinds of anchors, underlying sort of second order anchors in order to hold it all together. And the most important of that is rule of law and the enforcement of contracts. So ladies and gentlemen, this is a major national debate that we need to have about fixing our legal system. The judicial system is of course, the process is a part of it, but the broader legal system because without that, this <coughs> new India cannot be built on the basis that I described. The other thing that needs to be fixed in this is the clarity of the rules. There's one thing is the enforcement of contracts and the enforcement of rules. But of course, there is a major problem with the clarity and transparency of those rules themselves, which is a major, major problem because in India, the state can ask the citizen to follow rules, which is perfectly good, but surely it is important that the citizens understand what are the rules that they're supposed to be following, which is not at all easy in the case of India. I'm not just talking about businesses, but even as common citizens, it is not at all obvious to us what are the rules, procedures, forms that we are supposed to adhere to when we are interacting with the state. And in this context, we have put forward a reform called the Transparency of Rules Act, 
which uh, or TORA, which by the way, those of you interested may want to look up the economic survey and look up. Because we would like to instigate a debate around TORA. But what are the elements of TORA? I think you need to have some sense of it so that you will see why this is such a fundamental shift in the relationship between the common citizen and the Indian state. As I said, one of the real problems in India is that the average citizen simply doesn't know what the rules he's supposed to adhere to. This leads to all kinds of inefficiencies, litigation, not to mention corruption. So, this Transparency Rules Act will have three elements and I'm going to describe each of these elements. The first element that we have is that all citizen and business facing rules of every department will be placed on the website in English and Hindi and where required regional language. And every single rule procedure form will be put on it. And once a department has been declared as TORA compliant, only those rules which are there on the website will apply. Now, hear this clearly. This is important. Because effectively what it means is, if there is a rule procedure that is not being explicitly put on the website of the relevant department after it's become and declared TORA compliant, that rule will be deemed not to apply. This is a fundamental change in the relationship between the citizen and the state. Basically what we are saying is, the citizen only can be asked to follow rules that he has a reasonable chance of finding out what those rules are. Second, all the rules will be placed as a whole and not as a series of circulars. This is important because all of you use Wikipedia, I'm sure. Do you go into Wikipedia and go through its entire history to figure out what it is the current state of play? No. Why on earth should you be going through a whole long list of circulars in order to figure out what it is that you're supposed to do? So every rule has to be presented in its current form and if those of you are particularly interested, there will be a history button, just like in Wikipedia, you can click on it and it will tell you the long history, all the circulars at the back end. But the average citizen, all he really needs to do is to essentially be, see what is right now what he's expected to do. And the third thing that will be an element, which is a critical element, is that every time it is changed, the time and date of that change is clearly stated. So that now what happens essentially is that you as a citizen can know that yes, at 5 o'clock on the 5th of September in 2017, this is the law that applied. And if that is not what the law says on the website, then I'm afraid you cannot be asked to follow it. No government department should be able to tell you that sorry, there is circular number 43B subsection C that you did not follow. If it is not there on the website, tough. So I can, you can see very clearly how we think about this, these issues and how we intend to go about solving them. There are a whole bunch of new things that we intend to do in the going forward, which I mentioned, judicial reform and the transparency of rules. Already we have taken some action in this regard. Thousand odd old laws have been removed, those of you who are not aware, uh, from the statute books and thrown into the dustbin. And we intend to move forward along this path using this particular philosophical framework. Yes, it looks messy, but ladies and gentlemen, it gets the job done. Thank you.